Automated Control Systems, and Duke Warner Realty. The phone number again is 541-388-1110. Now, talk real estate only on FM News 100.1 and News Talk 1110 KVND. Central Oregon. Hello, Central Oregon. How are you today? It's a beautiful day here in Central Oregon. I'm to be informed by our weatherman that we're going to be looking for a little bit of partly sunny and cloudy afternoon. So here we are on a Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully you're having a wonderful day out there. Um, welcome to Talk Real Estate, your resource for uh, relevant real estate information that affects our Central Oregon community. Thank you for joining our broadcast, and please remember this hour is dedicated to you, the listeners. So if you have any questions or topics, feel free to call in, 541-388-1110. As that lead-in said numerous times, my name is Fred Johnson, and I'm your host today, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to start the show and, and, and acknowledge Memorial Day. Um, happy Memorial Day to each and every one of you. Uh, I won't subject you to a moment of silence while we're here on the radio. However, somewhere through the course of the day, take a moment to ponder uh, the 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 price of freedom, the price of freedom that we have here. You know, I, I looked it up, and there's a little bit of history to... Memorial Day. It actually started after the end of the uh, Civil War, and it was called Decoration Day at that time to honor the Union and Confederate soldiers who died. You know, and that's that's one of the things that's different about Memorial Day over Veterans Day. And Veterans Day is great; it honors all of our people in uniform, past and present, that have served our country. But Memorial Day acknowledges the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. Those mothers fathers, grandmothers, brothers and sisters that received the message that one of their loved ones was lost in a conflict um, that allowed us to have have the freedom and, and have the privileges that we enjoy. It, it dawned on me that w- words that we use and take a little bit for granted, such as freedom, rights, entitlement. You know, there's a number of places in the world where really those those words aren't, aren't acceptable. And uh, you know, there's obviously any one of us can turn on the news and, and see what's happening with some of the warlords and ISIS and all of that, that uh, I don't really want to make this a, a huge political stance. But no matter how frustrated we may get and we may get caught up on our individual topics, there's really been a sacrifice by a great number of people before us that have made this all possible. And, and somewhere through the course of the weekend, take a moment and reflect on the good aspects in your life and, and how great things really are. One of the places that you may want to do this, I guess all over Central Oregon this week, we're having a beer week. Sometimes that's a really great place to ponder. So, you know, get out there and enjoy Memorial Day weekend and have a little bit of fun. Again, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Um, As you know, last week was my first week back on the air. So I've got a little bit of housekeeping to do as a result of that show. I was asked some questions, and thank you very much for all of your participation. Um, One party out called and contacted me and wanted to know if I was my own sound engineer because some of the connections between the advertisements and the show were a little rough. And the answer to that question is, yes, I am. And thank you for your tolerance. I'm trying to do my best job here as I can, but uh, I wish each and every one of you could see the switchboard. It's uh, quite a daunting task, but hopefully I'll get better as, as time goes on. Another one is, I really encourage your calls. Please, please call in. Uh, this is an interactive show. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is uh, um, offer some giveaways along the way with some of our local merchants and participants that that can make that happen. So, wow, look at that. I've I've got a call here. Let's see if we can put somebody on the air here. Well, again, my technical expertise is not what it could be. Are you there? I'm here. Hello there. Hello there. You're on the air. You're wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the call. Well, I'm I'm excited to help you learn by making mistakes. Well, thank you so much. You know, every every button here has its own mind, and I get to push things, whether they're lit or they're not lit, and then I stand back and hope for the appropriate the appropriate action. So hopefully, I'm coming coming across clean on your end. Yes, you are. And just as I always told the grandkids, let's get out there and make some mistakes because that's the only way to learn. Boy, isn't that the truth? Get out oh, there, get is. involved. Um, how can I help you today? Do you have a, have a question or have, have? Yeah, I do. Um, I have a, a five acres out here on Arnold Market Road. Yes, ma'am. And I've only had it for about a year, and I am enamored of the neighborhood and, and everything about it. However, looking into the future, say in another 10 years or so, 
do you anticipate that the uh, that the uh, zoning lines are going to change in such a way that this might be able to be sub subdivided down the line? Well, you know, and, and that's that's a really good question. Who am I talking to, please? My name is Linda. Linda, thank you so much for the call, and Linda. You know, that's a that's a great a great question. And if you listened last week, you know, one of the things that I mentioned was that there was going to be some upcoming discussion on UGB. And uh-huh. this is uh, the UGB topic that we're talking about. And I'm actually going to, I've been talking to some people, I may be able to bring in somebody that we can interview that can offer a little bit of clarity. Um, in today's show, I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of a backdrop and a little bit of history as to how that process has started, why it started, and maybe an overview as to how long it takes to proceed um, in that direction. So hopefully I'll be able to you know, at least approach some of the those the questions that you may have in that regard in a little more depth as we go on. But today, the quick answer for you is probably not in the foreseeable future. Good. Um, uh, so I mean, actually, you know, I'm fine here, uh, and I uh, I like having the space. I like not. I I lived in Tumalo on Laid La Butte, and uh-huh. boy, when it sold. I was so lucky to get out when I did because now there's five strips going across Laid Law and big houses, I understand, everywhere. And the, the thousand acres I had behind our house to roam was just is gone. And it's, it's neighbors now. Well, that's, that's exactly right. And that's really one of the, you know, the overall purposes of the urban growth boundary process is to keep as much open land available for getting out and kicking and roaming around as, as we would like. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is here in Deschutes County, 82% of the county is publicly owned land. It's either BLM land or National Forest Service land. So What percent? 82%. 82% of the county. That's kind of scary. However... You know, it makes for a wonderful place to live. Well, it, it certainly does, and, and all of that land is op- open to the public. So if you want a dirt bike or horseback ride or walk or bird watch or whatever you may want to do, um, you know, literally it takes an act of Congress to eliminate the National Forest Service land. So I would say that it's a pretty safe bet that that's going to be available to us for our lifetime. Um, that's terrific because I'm about five minutes from Horse Butte. Oh, good for you. Well, there's there's some wonderful riding out that way. You know, one of the things that the people enjoy out that way is that if they have a horse, they don't need to trailer the horse to go anywhere else because uh, they can just ride for miles just outside the back fence. Right. Well, I heard it goes all the way to Polina. It, it does. It does. It goes all the way east. There's there's literally thousands of acres, square miles out, out that direction. You can you can ride to your heart's content, but before you take off, I would advise you to let a family member or somebody you know where oh, you're going. Yeah. So if you, don't know, if you don't make it back, they know where to come looking for you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, so I'm safe for the foreseeable future. Linda... And- you are you are definitely safe. There's sort of a two stage process. I'll give you that much to it right now. You know, with the with the urban growth boundary, basically what happens is there's the boundary itself, and then there's a reserve area, which will be the area that would be the next on deck to be uh, taken into the urban growth boundary. So that process allows for you know generally a five to ten year minimum period of time before that would happen. And has this southeast section? Even, I mean, I'm sure it's not even touted to be on reserve yet. It it really isn't. There are actually some some uh, uh, sewage issues to the southeast corner because the southeast is actually um, a little lower from the ridge going to the south from where the sewage treatment plant is. So that's one of those areas where there's some engineering issues that are going to stymie the growth in the foreseeable future southeast. And one of those issues is rocks. Well, there, we do have rock in Central Oregon, don't we? Mm-hmm, but I love it. Beautiful. You know, there's a big rock ridge on this property, and it it divides the barn, and and everyone says, "Gosh, it seems like it's bigger than five acres." And I think that's because it's wild, and it has, you know, it has this rock ridge, and it has uh, wild things on it. Well, Linda, thank you so much for calling in. It sounds like you've got a little slice of heaven out there, and really well, appreciate like your it, call and your support today. All right. We'll keep making those mistakes. Well, thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're going to sign off right now for a little uh, station identification, and we'll be right back to you shortly. Thank you so much for tuning in to Talk Real Estate. Welcome back to Talk Real Estate. 
with Fred Johnson. I'm your host. And it looks like we may have another caller on the line here. Let's see who's calling. Hello, you're on the air. This is Fred Johnson. Yeah, hello, Fred. Hi, what's your name, please? Uh, my, uh, my name's uh, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Thank you for calling in today. Yeah, I was just uh, uh, wondering if you could um, perhaps um, look into your crystal ball and give me some idea of what you think uh, land values are going to go in the future in the Lapine area. The Lapine area? Yeah. Well, well, Jeff, I'll tell you, if I could find that crystal ball, I would be one blessed human being. I, I wish that I, that I had the future. Um, in my hand, in my business, that's a great way to go. Um, you know, the, the Lapine has done a number of things to move forward in the values, but the reality is um, Lapine is, if you will, it's, it's sort of a secondary market. Um, there's not an awful lot of employment opportunities for, for people. You know, the, the, uh, the sewage issues have been dealt with a little bit out there, but as the, as the sense of community starts to take shape, um, that's really the way that that we start to see appreciation, and I don't I don't really know I don't have those numbers with me, but I do know that there's still a, a high percentage of second homes in the in the Lapine area, um, and that and that's kind of what we need to establish our baseline for appreciation um, is sort of that you know that scarcity that neighborhood feel the services and all of that and it starts to starts to move up. Um, <laughs> You know, and Lapine, because it was a secondary market, when we went through our um, our recession period or whatever you would like to call the recalibration or whatever term you like to use for it, um, it was it was hit fairly hard, particularly with those those secondary homes. Um, mm -hmm. So it's taken us a little while. You know, the I, I guess the easiest way to to give a model to you of that, Jeff, is you know, is to sort of put on your appraiser's hat for a moment. And you know, for an appraiser, it's really easy for them to find value, particularly in a you know a tract home scenario, because there's one of four four plans. The garage is either on the left, it's on the right. The price per square foot, you know what's sold, you know how to compare it. It's real easy to have a have a baseline of value, and then you can compare that value to replacement costs and sort of know where you are proportionately. When you go into Lapine area and there's there's uh, miles of small acreage properties that you know some have wells, some have sewers, some can have wells, some can't or, or septics. Excuse me, I didn't mean sewer. Um, you know th that seems to be um, the the issue in finding those values and moving forward. And I know that mm -hmm, sounds, gotcha. sounds yeah. an awful lot like I'm dancing around here, but as there's <laughs> as there's more more continuity to your neighborhood, um, and there's more like kind properties that have value, that's going to help your property. Mm -hmm. And the property that's adjacent that maybe has the the single wide on that has had a series of sheds added onto it and has a little car collection in the front yard, maybe mm -hmm. isn't going to help quite as much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. Are, are you in a small acreage property? Yeah, I just uh, recently moved uh, from Bend out to uh, an area close to the Quail Run Golf Course. Sure, nice area. And uh, yeah, I have like an acre and a half out here, and um, just kind of curious as to where it could go in the future. I'm happy with what I've got right now, just as a place to live. But of course, always interested in, you know, what may be coming down the pike as far as values. Well, and and the the other thing that I would offer to you know put a little you know, a little uh, silver lining on it, if you will, is that with the property prices that we're currently experiencing in Bend, and as the, you know, the core properties are starting to appreciate, depending upon whose figures you take, but right now it seems that 17% is about, you know, is fairly common benchmark that a lot of different entities are using to talk about appreciation in our market. Um, mm -hmm. What's happening is at the, at the, at the uh, entry level end of the market, if you will, in that you know under three hundred thousand dollar price point, what's happening in Bend is basically if someone was looking for a home two hundred thousand dollars or under, there's really not much available for them. So then right. their options are to go out, and it's Lapine to the south or Redmond to the north, and then after those start to enjoy some growth, then it seems that Prineville comes into play, sort of as the as the second tier. At least that's what Bedroom has happened to us. You're Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I kind of noticed uh, with the mild winter that we had this year too. Um, you know, there was a lot of people that uh, 
have been put off by the uh, you know the drive into Bend um, from the Lapine area, mm-hmm. but uh, <laughs> it wasn't an issue at all this year. And you know, a lot of times we get complacent about you know changes in weather, and um, I'm just wondering if that could be a factor. You know, if we have several more winters as mild as the last one, you know, that could um, lure more people from the Bend area out into this area. That that has certainly historically that has certainly been an obstacle. You know, not only is Lapine a little higher in elevation, it's about 500 feet higher in elevation, so it gets a little bit more precipitation and more snowfall. But because of the the tree coverage, um, it doesn't allow for the sun to hit the ground to melt that snow after it hits the ground, so it lingers longer than it does. Mm-hmm. And so, in in past years where we've had some fairly significant snowfall, um, you know, the what may have been a 35 45 minute commute turns into an hour and 15 minute commute to an hour and a half and that that mm-hmm. dramatically impacts the convenience and con- and dramatically impacts particularly if they're commuters that are trying to live in lapine and work and bend right right yeah yeah right, so. well we didn't really have that this year like i'm saying if that you know if that's a long-term trend that we're seeing you know like i'm saying it could lure you know more people out into this area and also the low water table you know there's pluses and minuses to that but you know you can drill a well here and hit water within 30 feet as opposed to 800 feet of rock in the bend area you know and that that does have the negative effect on the you know the sewage um situation but on the other hand, the low water table is is a plus. Well, in in some regards, yes, but we're seeing some water quality issues in those shallow thirty foot wells, and uh, mm-hmm. so some of the uh, the wells that seem to be performing a little bit better in the Lapine market are those that go to you know they're they're not the seven eight hundred feet that we see east of Bend, but in the mm-hmm. you know one hundred and fifty two hundred feet range, then it gets down below that uh, um, that uh, basin that we have there with the Little Deschutes River, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and gets below the drain fields of some of those septic systems so that we don't have the bacteria and chloroform issues. So that, right. that seems to be, um, I've, I've had a few of them, as, as I'm certain you're probably familiar, of, of those weather, or water tests that have come back um, that have needed some form of mitigation to be able to use right, them as right. domestic water. True, yeah, yeah. Well, Jeff, well, best, best of luck to opinion. you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, please feel yeah. free to call in any time, or uh, you know, email me direct if if you have any questions or any topics you'd like to hear us discuss. We we're here for you. Okay. Okay. I enjoyed the show. Thank you very much, sir. We'll talk to you Bye-bye. real soon. Bye now. Well, hello, folks. I'm back with you, and uh, thank you so much for your calls and support. That's uh, it's it's interesting. You know, so many of us live in Bend, and we all have a little bit different perspective of of what uh, our little oasis looks like. And, you know, for those acreage properties, I think that the one thing that most of them can feel relatively secure in is that, that their values will, will, uh, will move and they will probably move up because there's really not an awful lot of that inventory coming in. And if we go back to, you know, our basic Econ 101 and we, we start drawing supply and demand curves, Basically, they're not making any more supply. I think it was uh, Will Rogers that said years ago, buy land, they ain't making no more of it. And, you know, as, a, as the urban growth boundary expands and they do more developments and they cut anew their 200, 300 building lots and then you can have two or 300 homes, you know, that can happen. And that's the purpose of the urban growth boundary. That can happen within the boundary. But to the outside, if we can't divide the land into smaller pieces, then the number of small acreage properties that are going to be coming onto the inventory um, is going to be dramatically reduced. Not reduced, it's just not going to be increased. So, you know, as, um, as I mentioned last week, you know, urban growth boundary, uh, I didn't realize how timely it was going to be. I said that it was on the horizon and would certainly be an issue um, coming forward this week. And uh, what we see here is oh my goodness um they're going to have a break on me here shortly i just get kind of carried away and start talking and don't even realize uh, what's going on when we come back we're going to talk a little bit i'm going to give you a little bit of the history of um of urban growth boundaries uh, when they started started in england actually in the 1500s so again you're uh, you're listening to talk radio talk real estate with fred johnson and you can call anytime at the station 541-388-1110 we'll talk to you after the break Central Oregon, welcome back. Happy to have you with us today. 
We're here to talk real estate. I'm your host, Fred Johnson. And today we've been talking about a, a couple of different things. Uh, primarily, we've been talking about acreage properties. And, and, and it seems that quite, quite a bit of talk is going on this week about urban growth boundaries, how has been going to grow, um, how safe am I in the place where I live, or how much money am I going to make if it goes, if it goes big. And, uh, I think that this week it was, it was pretty interesting. Our local television station, KTVZ, did a two part series about, um, the need for urban growth boundary, the, um, explosive, uh, um, appreciation as it was referenced, as well as, you know, was greed driving the, the rental market so that it was placing, uh, not only scarcity on the market and, and raising the rates. And, uh, you know, I've got a, I've got a couple of people in mind to to uh, going forward to bring into the station so that we might be able to to talk with them about some of those topics and see how they go. Um, what I'd like to do is, you know, today I'm going to give you a little backdrop on on the UGB, which is interesting. It actually has has a history and and a process, and and sometimes like our government processes, they don't really maybe work quite as efficiently as we would we had hoped. And and in an area such as Bend that has that has had some growth, there's certainly some successes, but there's certainly some failures which which lead back to it. And I think that one of the things that you'll hear from me a fair amount is I'll I'll refer to things as ecosystems. And the reason that I do is ecologically as well as economically, things are connected. And there's a balance counterbalance. And we can't just go into these complex situations and point our finger at one issue and say, my goodness, that's the problem right there, and then lay the blame on that person. And, and, and of recent, it seems that it's relatively popular really throughout our country to you know, go after big business, go up after anybody that has a profit motive. But then you know, if we stand and look in the mirror, each and every one of us has a profit motive because we'd like to provide for our family and we'd like to do things. So, you know, the, the quick answer to that is the, um, you know, our greedy landlords pushing the, the rental rates up. And, you know, in short, um, the rental rates are pushing themselves up because that's what people are willing to pay. But there's always been a percentage relationship between value of the property and its rental rate. So, in other words, if, if someone were to go to the bank and take their money out and buy a rental house for cash what they would be looking at is the percentage relationship between their rental income and the amount of cash that it costs to buy the property. You know, back in the day, years and years ago, um, we used to use what was called the 1% rule, which the 1% rule said that if you had a house that was worth $50,000 and you rented it for $500 a month, which is 1%, then that was a, that was a fair and equitable rate. Uh, and 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 so on. So if you had a hundred thousand dollar property, that should rent for a thousand dollars a month. Well, if you followed that same model today and you went to a four hundred thousand dollar home, that would mean that it would it would be up to you know four thousand dollars a month, which is which is quite extraordinary. Now we're seeing about half of that. So maybe a two hundred thousand dollar home rents for a little better than a thousand dollars, and a four hundred thousand dollar home rents for a little better than two thousand um, dollars. But but still, what we're seeing historically, and and I've got you know a graph here in front of me, and once again, I find myself not being able to show you the the graph. But what it shows is that if we're in a market that we're seeing seventeen percent appreciation, um, the rental market is only moving at about a nine and a half ten percent appreciation rate. So it's lagging behind a little bit. So I don't think that that our our nemesis is necessarily the greedy landlord that's trying to push us out of homes. There were a number of things that happened with the, the last time that we had uh, a value starting to bump up, and actually some larger apartment complexes got converted into condominiums, which basically took that inventory out of the available rental market and transformed it into you know ownership opportunities. But what that did when the market has shifted to where it is now, suddenly we don't have that number of available apartment buildings um, that was once in the inventory here in the city of Bend. So between our growth and between some restructuring, and then we're also, quite honestly, coming off of about a 10-year period of time that there were not a lot of, of properties built for rental uses. There weren't a lot of duplexes, fourplexes, uh, apartment buildings built to fill that inventory and to find some of the needs, fill some of the needs for rental rental properties here here in Bend. Um, there was, however, 
this morning? Was it this morning or was it yesterday? No, it was on Thursday, actually. It, it says here that there's a, a Eugene builder um, that is uh, uh, proposed a plan off of Bellevue over here, uh, kind of over by the uh, – it's easy to give uh, breweries as a reference point. Everybody knows where they, they are. So it's over by the Worthy Brewing Company there on the east side, and they're talking about building a 153-unit apartment complex. Um, which is a which is a, a great thing. They're they're very happy about uh, coming into the area. They're very very happy about being able to to bring some additional inventory into the market. And the and the other thing that was really quite great is they're using local contractors to do the building, local architects to do the engineering and design. So it's really it's really quite a, a you know a remarkable thing that that there is additional inventory coming. We are definitely at a time where there's a, a bit of a pinch with that available inventory um and 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 so you know there there is some some hope on the horizon but i think that will ultimately come down to that that urban growth boundary that urban growth boundary issue and 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 that will come up so hopefully what we'll do is we'll get a guest in that will basically talk to us about some of the trending rates some of the you know smaller homes apartment opportunities that are coming in um, you know, there's also been some play toward that, which may hopefully with some relief in, you know, the, the systems development fees issue. And, and I don't really want to be a, um, one of those that just continually pounds the drum on that. But just for discussion's sake, on, on this apartment complex, if the systems development fees remain true to form and they charge, uh, you know, $20,000 a unit, that means that there's $3 million worth of fees added to just that simple project. Um, you know, as I introduced last week, if you're buying a $200,000 home and the systems development fees are $23,000, and that means that you've added 10% to the overall cost of that property. So when we talk about affordable housing and affordable housing keeps coming up over and over and we look for, you know, the villain who has created that, um, you know, it's in part the urban growth boundary, it's in part the taxation and fee structure, and it's in part being driven by the market and, this, and the scarcity of property. It's sort of what's moving in that direction. And I think that there's some people that are much more versed in the issue than myself that could come in and share that, share that with us. I've got a couple of minutes here before the break. So what I wanted to share, which I, th- I thought was really quite interesting, that, you know, urban growth boundaries, you know, where did they come from? When were they started? We know that they were started here in Oregon in the 70s. Um, but it was actually first started in the 1500s where the Queen of England and the city of, city of London um, decided that she wanted to have a, a green belt um, around the property and wanted to keep the farmland close to the city but yet open and arable and still producing fruit so that the transportation of fruits and vegetables into town was still relatively close. So basically the, the first urban growth boundary was, was created some years ago. And urban growth boundary is just loosely defined as a, as a map around the city that allows for residential development on the inside of that, and then it allows for productive land on the outside of that. And, and you know, in Bend, as we, or as, in the state of Oregon, actually, you know, uh, our last urban growth boundary was established in 1984. So what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a land use mapping that was, was designed in the 70s, and was implemented in the 80s and as everybody that lives in the area realizes we've had a fair amount of growth and and immigration that has come into our area in that time so that's the reason why the two downsides of an urban growth boundary is that we'll have inflated housing prices and increased density Um, that's just part of the model that happens when you implement the urban growth process so as much as we enjoy our open lands, we also have to come to the realization that if we don't expand the lands, then the only thing that we can do within that halo is to increase the density, and that means either smaller lots side by side or going vertical and creating multi-story structures to to accommodate our housing needs. Um, again, you're uh, you're with Talk Real Estate with Fred Johnson. You can call me anytime here at the station at five four one three eight eight eleven ten. You can always. Uh, well, there was a little bit of an issue this last week with my website, which is askfredjohnson.com. There's a toggle there that will take you to my email address. Um, those people that tried to use the contact form, apparently my tech people tell me that wasn't working well last week. Hopefully it's going to be better this week. Or you can always email me direct at fred at dukewarner.com. Uh, again, uh, after the break, uh, we'll get into a couple more issues. And please feel free to call in, and we'll talk to you real soon. Well, what do we got? 
Well, we've got somebody calling in. I'm going to put them on hold, and then after we break for commercial, we'll come back and, uh, and whoop, they left me, huh? Uh, and we'll come back. And, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about, apparently last week I talked relatively rapidly through the vacation the vacation uh, rental issue and uh, uh, left a, left some some questions on the table and I just kind of wanted to clarify those just a little bit um, before we move on. Feel free to call in anytime, 541-388-1110 and we'll see you after the break. Hi there and welcome back. Hopefully you weren't too enamored by the werewolf of London there. I'm Fred Johnson, I'm your host and we're, you're on uh, Talk Real Estate. Today we've been talking about a number of different issues, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is uh, once again thank my listeners for all of your continued support. All of your input is great. You can uh, call in anytime at 541-388-1110. You can go to my website, which is askfredjohnson.com. If you have some issues, have some topics you'd like to have discussed, or you know somebody that you'd like to hear interviewed, get them on the show so that we can talk through some of these issues in a little bit of depth with somebody that actually knows what they're talking about. Um, it could be really fun for all of us. So please don't hesitate to do that. You can also, in the interim, until I get some of my tech issues fixed, you can always email me direct at fred at dukewarner.com. But uh, today, uh, this week, uh, at, the, at the end of last week's show, I, I went into um, a, little, a little personal editorial, if you will, on did, did we miss an opportunity with the short-term rental issue in the city of Bend, the vacation rental as it, as it is known by a lot of people. And, and I sort of closed with a, with a couple of statements, and, and someone called me back and asked if I could maybe clarify some of those. And the, and the statements that I, that I mentioned were black market, license, room tax, and what did I mean by we had missed um, an opportunity. And, and so, you know, if, if I can, once again, just sort of clarify that. Um, one, I think that, that, you know, as I expressed, you have the opportunity to go online. This is a, this is a service that is provided throughout the world. And it's, it's a service that's obviously being embraced by travelers throughout the world. And as each and every one of us realize, the bin market is driven in good part by the tourism industry and those people that want to come and have goods and services in our area. And the approach with the whole review process seemed to be, how can we stamp this business opportunity out? as opposed to how can we make it work so that it's a viable part of our community. And so I think that the, the other thing that is obviously on the horizon and is equally emotional topic is the OSU Cascades campus coming on. And those, of course, that are opposed, you know, oppose the fact that there will be college-age students that probably have an inclination to party on the weekends and all of that, and that's going to invade their neighborhood as well. So... My feeling on that was that maybe the city of Bend does, in fact, have a need for a good neighbor policy. And a good neighbor policy would affect all rental properties, whether they be short-term rental properties or long-term rental properties. And the person after, I, I have no idea how to set it up, but after a series of complaints or whatever, then that effort would be directly directed to the property owner themselves to mitigate the problem and to allow the property to integrate well within the neighborhood. And again, I don't care if it's short term or long term. If you have, you know, college kids that are having keggers every Monday, Wednesday and Friday night and they're really being disruptive and the police have responded a couple of times, there needs to be some accountability there for that and the and the owner landlord needs to take responsibility for that. It's not just a sole issue that deals with short term rental properties. So I think that that was one policy that could have been implemented citywide. Everybody would have embraced the fact that we have a good neighbor policy so that it does keep the disruptive rental properties in line. On the other, on the other hand, um, how are we going to license and tax um, those short-term rental properties? And, and I, for me, it, it seems to be a relatively easy process in that if someone is running their short-term rental property as a commercial enterprise, in other words, they are marketing to strangers via the Internet or online, um, newspaper, whatever, and they're basically trying to sell their vacation rental um, at a commercial level, then that, that is a, a commercial vacation rental, and that is one that should be licensed. 
and that is one that should also generate a room tax because those are the properties that would be going in direct competition with our other motels and hotels that we have in town that are providing a like kind service. Now, now the the, the other term that that came up was was black market. And, and black market is black market is kind of an interesting interesting term. But uh, you know, my son asked me a couple of years ago. He asked, "What is vice and what is black market?" And I said, "Well, son, it's a it's a uh, it's something that people enjoy that is against the rules until which time as we figure out a way to tax it and then it becomes acceptable." And that's basically what what the reference was with the vacation rentals was if the, someone wasn't paying taxes and wasn't doing the licensing, then they were a black market rental. Well, what if you were an absentee owner and you had a vacation home here and you had your good friends that wanted to come to Bend and they wanted to stay for a week and stay in your house and you charge them $100 for that week? Um, that's really not a commercial vacation rental. It probably doesn't need to be licensed or regulated anywhere. It probably doesn't need to be a room tax because it's a, it's a shared issue between the friends. But the unfortunate issue that has happened is as this progress program has gone forward one the density issue decreases the number of potential vacation rentals and it also decreases the number so if if i live adjacent to a vacation rental though my neighbor has exactly the same zoning and the same property that i do he can use his property differently than i can use mine because of the density issue but more importantly it doesn't create the revenue and the income to the city to be able to justify the additional staff that would it would take to regulate that program where the licensing and the tax base would allow them to hire a couple people it'd be very easy for them to police they would just simply go online type in a vacation home in bend for such and such a weekend and those that come up verify that they're on their licensing list and if they're not on the licensing list pay them a visit and say hey you're a commercial enterprise, and we'd like to have you licensed, and we'd like to collect some tax from you. So now now what has happened is with this density issue, it's sort of promoted, the again, the black market so that people can sort of rent their properties off of the cuff and until which time as somebody comes by and tries to police the issue and pull them into the fold, it decreases the number. There's not a funding source for it to move forward. And it it uh, it puts the city in sort of a precarious position where it would be very open to business as it was before. So I'm hopeful that I that I clarified that a little bit more. I didn't mean to brush past it. I gave so much background as to the different user types and that they weren't all just a traveling fraternity party that wanted to come over here and go absolutely wild in our fair city, but that in fact they were they were fair, legitimate family users, uh, people that were scouting our area for relocation, people that were coming here for a baseball or a soccer tournament and 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 they they create um you know while those people are in town they're shopping in the grocery stores they're using the restaurants they're using our facilities they're buying ski passes and i don't really think that that it's 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 appropriate for us to turn a business into a land use issue and then try to eliminate it from our fair town and then the poor people on the east side had this thing imposed on them, and they don't have any idea what the heck we were talking about. They don't have vacation rentals in their neighborhood. It's not an issue. But yet their properties, too, have been had this overlay laid over them to where there are some regulation as to how they can use their properties going forward. So anyway, there's there's my issue. I'm I'm done with the vacation rental at this issue. I hope that that uh, our city fathers and and city council members will readdress the issue and take a look at it, try to rein it in a little bit, and really try to lay out the groundwork for the forthcoming uh, influx of students that are going to be coming into the area, which, which too will create a situation where there's going to be some backlash from the neighborhood when uh, there's going to be increased density, more and more cars, more and more people, more coming and going, and uh, the, so that the, particularly in close in close in on the west side it's going to change the dynamics of the neighborhood fairly well so again i, I welcome i welcome your calls your input um this uh, this next week we'll we'll try to talk about something a little bit more flavorful but i also want to get on the defensible space issue um i think that that's something that we really do need to discuss but in the, in the meantime thank you so much for listening to uh talk real estate with fred johnson and uh, until next week, um, have a great time. And don't forget to take a moment out there and, and uh, 